Hey everybody, welcome back to the salon. So I am an absolute sucker for a well-told and terrifying short story. Yes, novels are fantastic too, and yes, they can conjure an entire world that you can lose yourself in for days or weeks at a time, but I have to say there's something really special about that sharp jolt from a short story that can be read all in one sitting, and I think horror specifically uh, usually benefits and is a lot more effective uh, when it's shorter, like it's a lot more impactful. Uh, short stories are actually my preferred medium for writing as well, and I kind of hope that eventually, one day, before I die, uh, that I'll be able to create something even partially approaching the impact of some of my very favorite short stories of all time, which include H.P. Lovecraft's Pickman's Model, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death, Oliver Onion's The Beckoning Fair One, um, The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, uh, The Triumph of Death by H. Russell Wakefield, and Clive Barker's In the Hills, The Cities. Now, when I was a little girl, uh, one of my very favorite things to do was go to the library, because I was kind of a nerd, and check out one of the giant horror anthologies that sort of flew under the Alfred Hitchcock Presents banner. There was a shit ton of them published. Uh, I actually looked it up. There were 170 of them altogether uh, that were published between 1945 and 2000. 45 of them had the precise Alfred Hitchcock Presents wording, but you know all the other ones, some of them were just Alfred Hitchcock's blah blah So so yeah, 170 of them. I didn't even realize that were that many. It's a fuck ton. Um, so I'm saying like over the course of my childhood, I probably read like a fairly large chunk of that total like during my formative years because every time there was a different one in the library, I was like, ooh, and I would like pick it out. Um, now the stories that were in these Alfred Hitchcock anthologies were a huge influence on, you know, me when I was a little nugget. And cause I was already like, if when I was a little kid, already kind of starting to show a penchant for, you know, horror stories. Like I really loved anything scary, especially if it was like in the written form. Now my maternal grandfather who knew of my budding horror literary aspirations, I guess, he gave me one of the anthologies out of this vast, dusty collection of books that he kept in these teetering stacks, like on the floor of his creepy overstuffed house. It really was kind of like something like out of a movie. Um, now the house sadly is long gone, but I still have the book. Here it is, <laughs> sad, look at that shit. Uh, yeah, it, it's seen better days, obviously. Uh, yeah, so the pages have mostly fallen out. I've, you know, had to tape it up like a whole bunch of times. And as you can see, the kitties, mostly Pookie, but Beijing uh, was in there too. She uh, kind of pulled off, they pulled off the uh, spine here, and I think they probably ate it in small degrees. So there was that. Pookie really likes pulling the spines off books, which is why I only keep like super shitty ones like down below. So she doesn't really like... How, you know, so she doesn't get into the good ones. But uh, yeah, so this book in particular was published in 1967, which was only five years before I was born. Uh, so you can't tell from the title because it only has Alfred Hitchcock's, uh, you know, signature on it, but it's actually called Alfred Hitchcock Presents Stories That Scared Even Me. And even the title, like as a kid, like really intrigued me. I was like, oh my God, these stories scared Alfred Hitchcock. That's hardcore. And I was like, so into it. Now, unfortunately, this collection is out of print. Uh, but you can find used copies floating around on the internet out there. And I'm going to say if you're into like a lot of the horror fiction, a lot of the horror writers and the, some of the sci-fi writers too, uh, that came out around the 1920s to the late 1960s, including actually a lot of writers who wrote for stuff like the Twilight Zone and things like that, I would actually recommend that you pick up a copy of this one uh, in particular or, you know, some of the other myriad ones that came out around this time period. But this one in particular is the most consistently great horror anthology that I've ever read. And I've read a lot of them. And I know that your mileage may vary on that one because I have seen some reviews of this where they like, oh, only 65, 70% of the ones are like really great in it. But I think every single story in this is good. I don't think there's a single dud among the 25 stories that are in here. And I honestly don't think there's a story in here that isn't like great to excellent at the very least. Um, you know, there's stories about there's weird monsters, there's dystopian stories, there's vampires, zombies, Nazis, uh, creepy kids, suburban kind of horrors, sci-fi stuff, and just any number of other things. So the collection really has something for damn near everybody. It's a huge, huge, like vast array of different uh, subgenres of horror. 
So while it's difficult to choose my favorite stories out of such an embarrassment of riches, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just kind of briefly discuss each of the 25 stories in this. And as I go along, I'll kind of tell you which ones I loved the most and which ones have stuck with me the longest since I first read this as a little child. Set along the banks of Real Foot Lake in Tennessee, which I'm not sure if it's a real place or not, uh, which is described as an afterthought of creation. This story actually starts with a very evocative description of this mysterious body of water and the environs surrounding it. So this lake is supposedly said to be bottomless in places and contains these really terrifying gar and man-eating catfish of like monstrous size. And then it sort of gets into, like, there's a few pages of description just kind of setting the scene, and then it gets into the narrative proper. So the central focus of this tale is Fishhead, a man who was born along the shores of the lake and has lived there all his life. Now, local legends said that his mom had been frightened by one of the enormous catfish while he was still in the womb, and hence he came out looking like a person from the neck down, but with a face and head that was, quote, as near to being the face of a great fish as any face could be, and yet still retain some trace of human aspect. Not surprisingly, a uh, fish head lives alone, like on a little shack, uh, and most of the locals are afraid of him, though he does sometimes act as a guide for people that are hunting or fishing around the lake. Because, like I said, he's lived there his whole life and he's very familiar with the area. Now, these kind of like weird superstitious stories about him that all the locals sort of whisper to each other say that he stands on the shore of the lake and calls to all of the huge catfish with this weird spooky cry. And then he like jumps in the water and like swims and feeds with them like at night, like whatever gross shit it is that the catfish are eating off the bottom or whatever. So that's kind of like the stories about him. Now it turns out that there's these two redneck brothers and one day they ran into fish head on the lake and they had been drinking quite a bit and they accused him of some infraction and they capped off this rant by slapping him in the face fish head uh, retaliated by beating the snot out of both of them so the brothers decide that they're going to go back one evening at sundown and kill him in revenge this obviously does not go the way that they uh, imagined it, and they soon get to learn firsthand how true the tales of Fishhead's communion with the giant catfish actually are. So Mr. Sharstead is your typical Scrooge-like moneylender who has absolutely no qualms about kicking people out of their homes if they're a little bit late on their payments. At the beginning of the story, he's paying a visit to a guy named Mr. Gingold, who's this gentle older man with uh, an interest in antiques, who seems to have money, but is real absent-minded and doesn't really seem to give much of a shit about it. So he lives in this old house that's stuffed full of even older things, uh, and he wears these once expensive, like nicely cut clothes that are now sort of shabby. Like I said, it's like he doesn't really care about, about it. Um, but notably, he has neglected to pay the 300 pounds that he owes to Mr. Sharstead, and the money lender has come to collect it. Now, Mr. Gingold invites Mr. Sharstead to have some sherry with him, like have a sit down man to man, uh, because he doesn't have many visitors and he's kind of lonely. And in the course of this little tete-a-tete, the moneylender notices that Mr. Gingold has all sorts of these really rare and valuable antiques in the place. And so he starts wondering why this old dude is always behind on his bills if he has all this nice shit. Like, well, all he has to do is, like, sell this one Ming vase or whatever the fuck, and he could, like, pay his bills. What's his problem? Now, when Mr. Sharstead starts to approach the topic of money, like, hey, where's that 300 pounds you owe me? Mr. Gingold is just kind of like, la la la, can't hear you. Like, he acts like the dude didn't even say anything. And instead, he's like, ooh, come and check out this cool new thing that I just got. Now, this object turns out to be a camera obscura. And even Mr. Sharstead has to admit that being able to see this like panoramic view of the whole town is pretty awesome. You know what I mean? So he's like, okay. But Mr. Gingold then kind of pivots. And he shows the moneylender, uh, you know, while he's looking through the camera obscure, he's like, hey, look over there. It's the former home of the Thwaites family. Now, the Thwaites family, uh, Sharstead booted them out uh, due to lack of payment. 
And uh, Mr. Gingold is kind of like seems put out about it and asks him, he's like, hey, why don't you like let them come back in their house and blah, blah, blah. And Sharstead is just like, hey, man, this is like none of your business. And he's like, I'm absolutely not going to do that because they couldn't pay. Uh, so Gingold is like, well, you know, I'm kind of really sorry to hear you say that. Uh, and then he's like, hey, why don't you come upstairs to my workshop? I have something even more awesome to show you. So they go up there and uh, he shows him another camera obscura. Only this one shows the city as it was like many, many years ago. I think it's like back in the 1920s because this story I think was set in the 50s or 60s. Um, almost as though this camera obscura is kind of like magic and it can like look into the past. So Sharstead is pretty freaked out by this as you would be and he leaves but he finds that once he's back out on the street he's actually trapped in the long ago era that was shown during the device, which like I said, I believe was 1925. Now, interestingly, this story was actually adapted for uh, Night Gallery, you know, the show from the 1970s, which uh, Rod Serling hosted. Uh, this one was on season two, episode 12, on the same show as an adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's story, Cool Air. And there was also a story about Edgar Allan Poe, like as a character uh, that was called Quoth the Raven. But yeah, so this was adapted for Night Gallery, which I thought was pretty cool. This story, it so happens, uh, was also turned into a partial episode of Night Gallery, specifically season two, episode two, which uh, originally aired in 1971. All in all, a fairly decent adaptation, not exactly the way I was picturing it, but pretty good. So this is the story of a lonely undertaker named Jared Sloan, who has created an entire family of stolen preserved corpses in his basement to keep him company. And he interacts with them as if they are real people. Like he comes home from work, like he has uh, his living quarters are like in the basement of his you know funeral parlor, like he lives underneath it. Uh, so he comes down at night after work is over for the day. He sits in the living room with them, reading his newspaper, asking them about their days. They don't answer obviously, and telling them about his day and so forth. Now, Jared, the reason that he's like this, Jared was an orphan and was raised in like foundling homes when he was growing up. Um, so he never really had a family. Family. So he always said when he got to be an adult, he always wanted a big family, but somehow things never really worked out for him. And he ended up now completely alone. I believe he's like 58 years old. So this grotesque idea that he had of basically compiling a family out of other people's dead um, was initially kicked off when a woman he was desperately in love with married someone else, but then died not too long after that. Now he ended up handling her funeral because it's a small town and he's like the only undertaker. And he decided uh, that he was gonna steal her body and preserve it so that he could keep her forever. Now it's not sexual at all. Um, he basically just posed her in the piano in the living room because she liked to play the piano while she was alive. So he like put her hands on the keys and like she's turning around smiling at him. Um, he seems to be like asexual. Like he seems like pretty grossed out by the thought of sex in general, <laughs> whether with a living person or a dead person. So it's not like, as quite as necrophiliac as you might like think it might be, but I mean, it's still pretty gross, but you know. So little by little, as notable candidates come through his funeral home, he assembled a family. He's very calculating in that way. Um, they need to have something of a family resemblance, obviously, because that's a big deal to him. They obviously can't have been killed in a way that really mangled their bodies, you know, which, you know, goes without saying, uh, you know, and so forth. Now, at the beginning of the story, he has the wife, uh, he has a 10-year-old son, parents, a grandmother who he put like sleeping and like napping on the couch, and uh, a younger brother and sister. But what he wants more than anything to make his little family complete is a daughter. Now, it so happens that a beautiful little girl has been abducted for ransom from like the next town over. And it also so happens that the kidnappers drop the murdered body of the girl on the doorstep of his funeral parlor. So then Jared sort of has to wrestle with the decision of either doing the right thing by the girl's family by reporting it, uh, since her parents think that she's still alive because they paid the ransom, or adding the perfect daughter to his own family. This whole story just, I mean, it oozes this very cold atmosphere and I have to say that you kind of feel a, a weird, like helpless empathy with 
Jared because he's just so sad and like so bereft. So this one actually has like a real emotional punch to it, even though it sounds like pretty gross. Like the whole idea of what he's doing is obviously disgusting and morally reprehensible, but you somehow kind of still feel sorry for him anyway, which is something that I think a lot of writers, I don't think they would have been able to pull that off very effectively, but this story absolutely does. Um, and in case it didn't, it wasn't clear, this is uh, easily one of my favorite stories in the whole collection. Now this story, and admittedly I never didn't really think of it this way until I reread it for this video, but this is almost kind of like a reverse telling of the blob, but also with like some ancient aliens kind of like flavor in there as well. So it's a frame story, and there's like a bunch of passengers on a banana boat, and they come across this stranded scientist named Goodbody, and he starts to tell them about this lost expedition that he was a part of. Now his group, he says, befriended a tribe of Ahu Indians, and they told him a legend about a race of gods who came from the sky a long time ago. So the expedition go out to this bad place uh, where the gods supposedly fell, although the Ahu nope out and refuse to go any further with them. Now, once there, like the scientists find this big metal thing that looks like a star chart, uh, which plots a course pretty clearly from Mars to Earth. And they also find this big machine that could conceivably be a spacecraft. Now, they also unfortunately discover a whole bunch of like gross gelatinous sort of like quasi human creatures. They're about four feet long and they have rudimentary limbs and also walnut sized brains. Now, they suck the blood out of animals, but they seem to be afraid of people. Like when they come up to people, like they are like, just, and they kind of like, you know. Now, most of the party uh, end up dying from snake bites or exposure or what have you. But Goodbody obviously makes it back to the Ahu village and hence to the boat where he was found at the beginning of the story. Now, one of the passengers who has been listening to this uh, thinks that Goodbody's story is a crock uh, and he points out, hey, if these men without bones uh, were indeed Martians, as you were implying, then how in the hell did they like smelt metal and how did they build a big spaceship and stuff if they were mostly just made of goo like you described them? And I'm gonna say that this leads to one of the best closing lines in a horror story that I've ever read. The closing line is, those boneless things are men. We are Martians. Now, I think I first read this story when I was about nine years old, and I liked it, but I didn't really understand the import of its very chilling, like, final lines at the time, because I was just a kid. I read it again when I was a bit older, and then I finally got it. I was like, oh, now I understand what the ending means. And thereafter, this actually became one of my favorite stories in the book. Now, this takes its title, of course, from the famous T.S. Eliot poem, The Hollow Men, uh, the last lines being, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Uh, so this is a post-apocalyptic story with kind of like a fucked up Adam and Eve sort of vibe to it. So the entire population of the planet has been wiped out by a plague, the first symptom of which is a kind of full body paralysis. There is actually an antidote for it, but it came too late to really save anyone. The only two people left on Earth are a kind of shitty 35-year-old guy named Rolf and a super prissy religious fundamentalist woman named Louise, who's about 40. Now, Louise was actually a nurse before the world went swirling down the toilet, and she seems to have a natural immunity to the plague, but she also seems to have disassociated from reality somewhat because of all of the horrible things that she saw, like, while all the shit was going on. Now, she reluctantly agrees to meet Rolf after she realizes that there's nobody else left. Now, Rolf is keen to repopulate the planet, as it were, uh, though he's pretty disappointed that Louise is the only woman available. Uh, at some point, he actually does consider raping her, but although he's shitty, he's not that shitty. Now, because Louise is such a stickler for tradition, even though there's literally nobody else on Earth, she will not have sex with him unless they're married, and Rolf has to go through this whole kind of ridiculous courtship charade for her, like, in order to get some, and he has to promise her a wedding, like, with all the trimmings and everything. So the entire story pretty much, like, takes place in this department store cafe in Salt Lake City, Utah, where Rolf is trying to convince Louise to marry him so he can get started on that whole 
impregnating her thing. Uh, he also, at one point, hopes that maybe she'll have a daughter, which... Yuck. I mean, maybe maybe he really is that shitty now that I'm thinking about it. Now, when she finally agrees to marry him, Rolf very happily like is like, hooray, you know, and he I'm going to get some now. He happily excuses himself to go to the bathroom in the cafe. Once inside the bathroom, though, the paralysis, that's the first stage of the plague, hits him. Now, even though he has the antidote, he can't move to get it. And remember how the whole entire story was setting up just how very proper and very prudish Louise was? Here are the last two lines. Behind him, he was aware of a tiny click as the door, cushioned by the hydraulic check, shut forever. It was not locked, but its other side bore the warning, men. (laughs) I love that. See, when I was a kid, I didn't get... I had kind of skimmed over the whole paralysis thing and I didn't really get the full import of like her being like super, super uptight and like she would never go to the men's room like looking for him, you know what I mean? So I didn't really realize, because I think I'd miss the whole like paralysis being the first stage of the plague thing. Um, I think is probably why I didn't get it. But once I once I finally got it, I was like, oh, I was like, now that ending makes sense. And then I was like, oh, this is one of the best stories in there. So this is another one of the best stories in the collection, in my opinion. Uh, as I said, they're not all best stories, but they are they all uh, are actually really good. So Simon Potter is not a popular kid. Uh, he's very small for his age. He's very quiet, very deferential, very polite, and probably too smart for his own good. At the beginning of the story, this kid turns up on the doorstep of a classmate, Ronnie Jarman, for Ronnie's birthday party, even though he was explicitly not invited. So the whole story is told from the point of view of Ronnie's mother, Alice, who is immediately creeped out by this little kid. So the party goes about the way you'd expect a kid's birthday party in mid-1960s England to go. You know, at one point, like Simon, like I said, is unpopular, so he's just kind of like off to the side most of the time. Now, at one point, he tries to interest everyone in a game, but they think his idea for a game is stupid. So they opt instead to play murder, a whole game which entails like some people being like, you know, you're the victim and you're the investigators. And we have like all these fake, you know, here's like spaghetti and it's veins and it's, you know, here's grapes and their eyeballs and blah, blah, blah. That kind of kind of stuff so like fake body parts and whatnot so they're in the middle of the game when ronnie's dad tom finally comes home uh to alice's great relief because she just can't deal with all these fucking little fuckers like running around the house like trashing it uh she tells him that she thinks that the other kids have done something to simon during the game because she keeps hearing like these weird thumping noises coming from upstairs so tom says oh don't worry about it i'll go and check it out now a bit later alice comes in and tells these rowdy kids to like knock off this game because it's time for cake and ice cream and this part of the game like uh was done in the dark so she comes in and she turns the lights on and then all the kids freak out uh because they realize that the fake body parts that they thought they were holding uh which include like a severed hand a snippet of hair like a couple of squashed eyeballs are actually real turns out that simon the kid is just fine but ronnie's dad tom not so much so uh it's also important to note that simon uh his dad had died and um yeah and so the kid was kind of like a psycho now interestingly as i was researching this post uh here was something that i didn't know before i discovered that this story was also adapted for television in 1968 it was broadcast on a british anthology series called late night horror but it didn't have the name it didn't have the name party games it was called the corpse can't play but it was the same story so the telecast was actually thought lost for a really long time Uh, until a 16 millimeter print of it turned up in 2016 and it's since been restored and was actually released to dvd along with like a really nice booklet and everything like that as recently as august of 2022 so isn't that neat i was like i don't think i mean if i got it i'd have to get like a region free because i can't play british uh, dvds over here obviously but i would actually be really curious to see it so if you've seen it like let me know This story is probably the shortest one in the book. Uh, Clocks in are only about five pages. It's essentially like a dystopian type story, um, and it details a future where there are two factions of humans, the wheeled sect and the footed sect. 
Obviously, the wheeled people go everywhere in vehicles, uh, and over time, their limbs have atrophied, so they can actually no longer walk, they just drive. Uh, the footed people, equally obviously, are pedestrians. So the government of this future society has come up with all these laws pertaining to the interactions between the two groups. Uh, for example, it's perfectly legal to run down a pedestrian in a crosswalk, provided that you honk your horn first to warn them. Uh, on the other hand, it's also legal for the pedestrians to be packing and to shoot your face off through your windshield if you attempt to run them over. So this one is actually less of a traditional story and more like a vignette describing an alternate future. Uh, so there's not much more to it than that. Incidentally, a German band who were big in the goth industrial scene in the 1990s, they I don't think they're still around, uh, were actually named after this story. This one's really more of a novella than a short story, um, but it's actually told in three parts. So Mr. Bond is a traveler. Where he's going, like where he came from, and why he's traveling are never really specified. It's not really important. Now he comes across this cozy inn called The Rest of the Traveler, which is run by a proprietor who's kind of weird named Crispin Sasserak. Now, Crispin's wife, Myrtle, makes what is called a lovely broth, and Crispin is really, like, almost orgasmically into this stuff. Uh, Mr. Bond has some, and he has to admit it is quite delicious, and he ends up spending a pleasant evening with this couple in front of the fire, telling them all about his travels so far. Now, Crispin insists that Mr. Bond next go to the inn owned by his brother, Martin, which is called the Headless Man. The hospitality at this place is also top-notch, and Mr. Bond passes another quite satisfying night there playing chess with his host, Martin, uh, commenting particularly on the beautiful hand-carved ivory chess pieces. And then it turns out that the Sasseracs also have a third brother named Stephen, who likewise owns an inn. Uh, that one's called The Traveler's Head, and Mr. Bond is sent there in turn on the following night. So the brothers have this manservant named Stennett, who drives the guests between all the inns. It's all very, like, they have a whole system worked out. Uh, the main thing at the third inn is that Stephen has this massive brood of, like, bratty, what they call unlovely <laughs> kids who aren't far off from animals, and they play this weird game where they throw wooden balls through this big board with a bunch of holes in it, uh, and their dad calls it practice. Now, unfortunately for Mr. Bond, it turns out, uh, as I mentioned, that these three brothers have a whole system going on. Stephen, at the Traveler's Head, as you might have guessed, keeps the Traveler's Heads so his kids can throw balls through the eye sockets of the skulls. Martin, at the Headless Man, peels off all the skin from the headless body and uses the bones to make the chest pieces. And Crispin, at the Rest of the Traveler, gets literally the rest of the Traveler, like all the scraps and skin and everything like that, so that Myrtle can make her lovely broth. I love this story so much. Um, it just has kind of like an eerie fairy tale kind of feel to it, like set in some kind of like otherworldly kind of place, or that was just the vibe it always gave me. And I really, really liked like the gruesome outcome of it. Like it's just so great. Um, I don't think there's ever been a TV or film adaptation of this one, but there damn sure should be. If anybody knows that there is one, like please let me know, because I really do love this story. So here's another tale of a traveler coming across an inn that he probably shouldn't have. This story is following a guy named Erniston Grant and his little dog, Flip, and he's wandering across Devonshire. Now, he soon gets hopelessly lost, uh, and he comes across this house, which is occupied by two sisters who are named Annabelle and Matilda Crask. They're weird, but they offer to make him some food and put him up for the night, and, you know, which he heartily appreciates. So Matilda is leading Ernest into his room, and then like she stops and listens at another closed door. And he asks, oh, do you have another guest in the house? Uh, rather ominously, she says, Annabelle has a guest. You are mine. Later that night, uh, he's actually awakened by the growling of his dog, and when he turns the light on, he sees Matilda standing there with a big-ass knife. She keeps calling him William and admits that she was going to kill him to keep him there because killing a man is the only way to keep him from leaving you. So it turns out that both sisters were in love with the same man, obviously named William, uh, but he took off and they've been waiting in this house alone for him to come back to them for all of this time. 
Annabelle already has a guest that she believes is William uh, in the form of a dead guy in the next room. But Matilda is certain that Ernestine is actually William. And she's like, Annabelle is just so far gone now. It's like, I can't believe she didn't recognize you. So obviously Ernestine is wigged out, calls the police. The police come and find that the guy in Annabelle's room is actually a dude who's been missing for a week. Uh, so it turns out that Ernestine and his dog, thankfully, uh, escape shaken but unharmed from these two fucking lunatics. So a guy named Herbert Smithers finds this old crusty knife in a drain in Whitechapel. He takes it to a pub and starts kind of scraping the muck off of it, but his buddy is just like, I don't think that's worth anything. It just looks like a piece of shit. But as he's cleaning it, it does look as though the handle has like a ruby in it, and the barmaid, Gladys, starts like remarking on it. Smithers comments that the knife feels like it's part of his arm, like it has some kind of like weird energy to it. And when Gladys asks to see it or hold it or whatever, he suddenly stabs her right in the heart. Uh, though moments later, he kind of comes back to himself and insists that he didn't do it. So the whole underlying concept of this story is that the knife obviously belonged to Jack the Ripper and was either possessed by evil from the start, thus leading Jack the Ripper to do what he did, or was alternately uh, imbued with the evil spirit of Jack the Ripper, which has permeated the object ever after. In either case, uh, whoever handles it starts to zone out and gets a bit stabby. So there's a beautiful countess who's married to a much older count. This count has an overseer who is rumored by the local peasants to be the devil himself. Now the count thinks these tales are all ridiculous. The countess is like kind of intrigued though and soon starts a little flirtation with said overseer. Though she does actually kind of excoriate him for encouraging her husband, the Count, to be more tyrannical in general. And more specifically, hey, um, why did you tell him to reopen his dad's old torture chamber, which we closed long ago? That's pretty fucked up. Um, but yeah, he's wanting to like reopen the torture chamber to keep those goddamn serfs in line. Now, the overseer actually jokingly plays along with the whole devil thing. I have no toes at all, only hooves, he tells her at one point, but she doesn't quite believe this, as she probably wouldn't. Now, the countess is very um, arrogant, and she's very sure of her irresistible beauty, and she plans to make the overseer, like, lust after her for a really long time and essentially beg her for it before she'll give in to him. Now, this plan seems to be going along nicely. Uh, the overseer is groveling. She's into it. Um, and then at one point, the countess says, I'll tell you what, you can essentially get to second base, I guess, if you'll give me this one tiny favor. I want, like, I heard that you could grant wishes and I want everlasting life, youth, and beauty. He's like, done. And then she gives up the goods, just as she promised. But now there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that the overseer probably is the devil, and um, I don't know if that's good news or not, but he does indeed have supernatural powers and can indeed grant everlasting life, which he does. So yeah, she is young and beautiful forever. Bad news though, is that the count finds out about his wife's little dalliance with the overseer and decides as punishment that he's gonna cram her into this itty bitty cage in the torture chamber, which he has just reopened. He tells her, well, I'll be merciful, not like my dad, and I'll let you out in the morning. But during the night, uh, the Count's enemies overtake the castle and kill the old duffer. Uh, and they also make plans to kind of like raise the entire edifice to the ground, which means it's implied that the Countess will be stuck in this little bitty cage, like all crammed up in this cage and buried under the earth, I'm presuming, because they're going to raise the castle for the rest of eternity because she lives forever. But at least she'll look good while she's down there, so... So this is actually a novella or a novelette, I guess you would call it. Uh, and it was actually first published in 1940. And interestingly, this was very influential on several uh, subsequent comic book characters, including The Heap, uh, Man-Thing, and eventually Swamp Thing. So this is basically like a pretty simple monster story where the creature is kind of like a partially sentient massive goop, I guess, that sort of resembles a person. And he's completely fascinated by people and animals 
and tears them to pieces pretty much just out of simple curiosity. So this one's pretty gruesome because like pretty fucked up shit happens to uh, people and particularly a German shepherd, like a dog. And that really, really bothered me. That fucking image like really stuck with me. Now at the end of the story, it's actually revealed that the monster was formed when a man named Roger Kirk died in the swamp and a bunch of mold like built up around his skeleton and essentially like became sentient kind of, which actually is funny because it sort of reminded me a little bit of that really shitty like z grade uh 50s or 60s sci-fi movie what was it called the horror of party beach where like there was that skull down in the in the bottom of the lake or whatever and like all the radiation or the toxic waste that they dumped in there like built up all these layers around it and like the monster came out so it's kind of like the same idea So this story is kind of another post-apocalypse kind of tale, and this deals with an American couple uh, called the Richmonds who are on vacation in Morocco when they discover that the United States has been wiped out by nuclear missiles. Now, though Morocco is at first largely unaffected, it comes to light that because all of the American banks and credit card companies have all been blown to smithereens and no one will accept American currency in Morocco, the Richmonds are in a little bit of a pickle as they can't continue to pay for their hotel or purchase food or do anything else that you would need money for. So, uh, you know, it kind of gets worse and worse. And then Mr. Richmond sort of like resorts to selling off like his electric shaver and whatever little like doodads that he can part with. Uh, and he discovers soon after that, that his wife has gone missing and no one seems particularly keen to help him find her. Now, interestingly, TV Tropes, uh, that wonderful website, actually uses this story as an example of what they call a persecution flip, uh, as the horror and the black humor of this story actually arises from Americans abroad being treated the same way that some Americans would treat like desperate foreigners on their own soil. So this is another one of my favorite stories in the collection uh, and one that really stuck in my mind from when I was a kid. I'm always kind of down for a good devil story and this one is kind of original, like has a little bit of an original take on it. It's kind of like dreamlike, which I really like. It gives me a real kind of Hotel California sort of vibe. It's just like very um, atmospheric, like it's just kind of like shrouded in this like uh, American Southwestern kind of atmosphere and has like all this stuff about Aztec myth on it. So this one is the story of an unsympathetic fugitive from the hangman whose name is Morgan. Now he escapes from his captor, who's like a cop named Hernandez, by essentially, you know, killing the poor guy and stealing his car. Now, after a while, he sees a priest walking alone through the desert and neglects to give him a ride because he has something like a portent of doom, like when he sees him. A short time later, though, Morgan rolls the car into a ditch and wrecks it and, like, wakes up later that night. Now, it appears that the priest that was walking by has rescued him from the car crash and offers to walk with him to the nearest city. Now, Morgan agrees, but is kind of a douche about it. Now, not long into the journey, uh, an amazingly hot woman on a horse rides up and offers to give Morgan a ride to this ranch nearby, and she tells him that the priest is actually a bandit. She also low-key flirts with Morgan, implying that she'll sleep with him if he comes with her. Now, the priest warns him that she's evil, but Morgan decides he's going to follow that pork sword wherever it leads, and he basically is like, all right, he's, and he gets on the horse and tells the priest to get lost. Of course, Morgan has made the wrong decision. The woman indeed lets him have sex with her, but during the act, he discovers that she has turned into a revolting corpse, and that this whole scenario is basically just the reckoning of his soul. Like Morgan's body died back in the car crash near the beginning of the story, and he was actually given the opportunity to go to heaven by continuing on with the priest, but of course he chose boobies and now has to burn in hell for all eternity. This is another pretty short story, maybe only three or four pages long, uh, and it's actually told in the second person, uh, structured as though a tour guide is talking directly to you. So you uh, are apparently touring a small castle, and after the rest of the tour group has left, you ask about this particular well in the castle where somebody named Mary Purcell has drowned herself. Now, the tour guide seems very shocked that you know such obscure information and agrees to take you to see it. 
Now, all the while, as the tale goes on, you're starting to realize that the reader, or the you that the tour guide is talking to, is actually the person who pushed Mary Purcell into the well and has returned to the scene of the murder. So the tour guide has twigged onto this pretty quickly and decides to exact some revenge on you while telling you that it won't do any good to scream because the walls are very thick. So there are a bunch of old ships quietly rotting away in an old estuary. And Pickard, uh, or Pick for short, has no shame at all about poking around in there to salvage anything valuable because he figures the ships are going to be cut up for scrap anyhow and the guard doesn't really seem to give a shit about catching potential thieves anyway. Now Pick has become so successful at his nighttime foraging that he finds it necessary to hire a helper who is this kind of nice gangly kid by the name of Gene. Now, the young man is initially game uh, for all this, but soon starts to ask if Pickard has ever heard anything creepy on the ships at night, like the sound of someone following him. Pick just essentially just laughs it off because he's really never had any strange experiences at all. A couple nights later though, uh, Gene doesn't return from his forage and Pickard searches the wrecks for several successive nights uh, looking for him, but doesn't find anything but the kid's hat floating in a puddle of bilge water. So at this point, he starts to get unsettled and remembers this old story that he heard about a welder who was trapped inside one of the ships while they were building it and died in there. Uh, he also has like this really eerie dream uh, that kind of wigs him out even more, where he's on one of the ships looking for some like big hunk of valuable metal, but that something horrible is like lurking just outside his field of vision. He ends up hiring another assistant named Fred, uh, who gets spooked on the job and nopes out after a couple of days. And only a week after that, Pick himself gets set upon by the zombie-like corpses of Gene and the original welder that he had heard the stories about. So Ed is a traveling salesman, uh, plying his wares in small town after small town. He's used to being given the brush off sometimes and having doors slammed in his face, but man, this town that he's working in on this particular day is the toughest crowd that he's ever had to sell to. Everybody seems to be looking at him all suspiciously, even the town constable. People sick their dogs on him, shout after him in the street. He's only made two sales and those seem to be like pity sales. What the hell is wrong with everybody in this town? He is asking himself. Well, it turns out that a local girl named Judy Howell has gone missing and it's suspected that she's been murdered. It also turns out that poor old Ed looks very much like the description of the person that was last seen with her that everyone presumed was the murderer. It doesn't seem to matter to anybody that Ed only just arrived in town and therefore could not be responsible. He's the new guy, he's the stranger, and the residents of the town aren't about to let him get away with killing one of their own. So this one is actually sort of a weird, like, fantasy-based mon monster tale. Like, uh, again, told us something of, like, a secondhand frame story. So a man named Mr. Marks is relating an anecdote that his father told him. So his father was a fisherman and on one occasion went to the Swedish village of Abisko on a fishing expedition. Now, while he was staying in a hotel, he said, uh, he had all these really weird dreams about blood and stuff like that, and then he was woke up to see that there was actual blood like coming through the keyhole of the door to his room, which was a door that communicated with the door uh, with the room next to his. Now, Marx's dad like peers through the keyhole and sees very clearly an eight foot troll with a blue face and yellow eyes eating a woman. Uh, the troll basically finishes eating her, licks all the blood off the floor, and then happens to look over the keyhole. Now, Marx's dad isn't sure if the troll saw him or not, and he's also actually not certain if he just saw what he thought he saw. So he's just like, you know what? I'm just gonna go back to bed and maybe pretend I didn't see that. Now, the next morning, he actually asks the hotel staff about the occupants of the adjoining room, and he's told that it's been rented by a professor and his wife from Uppsala. So he goes about his day hiking, fishing, whatever, but he starts to wonder, hey, maybe the professor can turn into a troll and like ate his wife, right? So when he gets back to the hotel in the evening, his suspicions seem to be confirmed as he's told that the professor's wife has gone missing and the professor is apparently like really acting really broken up about it. Now, Marx's dad sees the professor at dinner, recognizes that he's a troll and realizes further that the professor 
knows that he knows that he's a troll. You know what I'm saying? He's like, he's like, oh my God, you're a troll. And he's like, oh, that bitch knows I'm a troll. It's like that kind of situation. Uh, so then like the professor like kind of low key threatens him. He shakes his hand and says, and what shall I have for my supper tonight? He says, <laughs> like, while he's pretending that he's talking about what he's going to eat for dinner, but he's like, yeah, I'm going to eat you, bitch. So basically like the terrified guy like falls asleep in his room and, you know, not surprisingly gets awakened by the troll in his room, like trying to eat him. At which point he, I think he's like wields a rosary at him and this causes the troll to drastically shrink in size and kind of like fall out the window and then the professor i think is like found dead in a lake nearby the following day so you're meant to like assume that the dude actually could like transmogrify like into a troll so like i said it's kind of like a weird i know it's th white like did a lot of kind of like fantasy like high fantasy type of stuff and this is kind of like that but it's also sort of like more grounded in reality too So the narrator, whose name is Eric, has come to the home of his friend Henry Black in Mexico one evening, and he proceeds to tell Henry that he suspects he might be being followed, though he's kind of careful like not to oversell the threat too much. Now Henry, along with his housekeeper slash girlfriend, Frida, it's not super clear, um, has retired to this tiny Mexican village, and it's pretty clear that he's hiding from something. Uh, as evidenced by his very nervous nature and his insistence on going everywhere with his two Doberman pinchers, uh, which are named Loki and Inga. Now, at that point, like Eric sort of describes how he met Henry and eventually befriended him, uh, slowly gaining his trust through long months of visits and chess games and discussion. It turns out, though, that Eric actually knew exactly who Henry was when he saw him, and he finagled his way into his life in order to expressly take revenge on him because Henry is a Nazi in hiding and Eric is actually the child of a couple who were killed in the camps. And indeed he recognizes too that like Frida had some of the gold jewelry that was like taken from his mother like before she was killed and stuff like that. So a couple named Ted and Ellen. Uh, can't believe their luck when they purchase a lot in the very exclusive area of Clay Canyon for a measly $1,500. Now, sure, the former house on the lot burned down, uh, and some electrocuted doves were found on the land, along with some other dead animals. Uh, you know, that's a little weird. But hey, I mean, this was the stomping grounds of old Hollywood royalty. And Ellen in particular is really kind of over the moon at the deal they're getting. She's kind of hoping that once we get our dream home built on this lot, um, then we'll be able to be established and we'll be able to start the family that she's always wanted. Warning signs start pretty much right away, however. Uh, a bulldozer that's clearing the land before the, con before the construction like tips over and destroys the neighbor's car. These same neighbors then tell Ted and Ellen that the Spanish used to do hangings on the property, and there's rumors that there's pissed off ghosts like still haunting the vicinity. Uh, more accidents kind of plague the house's construction. There's like a worker gets blinded by uh, an acetylene torch. There's a rock, si a rock slide that like covers like a bunch of the stuff in mud. Um, and then Ted, like the husband, he busts his head open on a paint can and has to get stitches, like all that kind of stuff. And once the house is built, like Ted starts to hear weird noises in the middle of the night, like weird thumping sounds and footsteps and stuff. And Ellen starts acting really odd, like almost like she's ill or like something is sucking the life out of her or something like that. Uh, Ted also finds a mutilated dead raccoon on their roof. And after he kind of confides in a friend slash neighbor of theirs, the friend and neighbor is like, um, you know, maybe you should move uh, because we've been here a while and that property seems to maybe kind of have like a jinx on it. Now, this is sort of like a haunted house story, but it's very modern and it's very subtle, which is something I was like quite liked about it. It reminds me pretty strongly of Anne Rivers Siddons book, The House Next Door, which I've talked about on this channel before. Uh, it has that kind of vibe to it. And it's uh, kind of like a similar narrative about a, essentially like a newly built house that's cursed from the beginning. So this is kind of a short but very impactful vampire story, sort of. Uh, and this one is about two friends, Charlie, who's kind of like the village idiot, and, Ted, and Tad, who's kind of like a practical joker. 
So Charlie works as a handyman at the local funeral parlor, and he also, like, lives, he rents a room in the back of it. And Tad comes up with the idea to rib him a little bit, asking him if this uh, very pretty but newly dead local girl at the mortuary ever gets up and walks around. Uh, Charlie is like, man, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, quit, quit messing around. But Tad manages to keep a straight face, uh, and he tells Charlie, you know, there were rumors that that girl was bitten by a wolf before she died. Because Charlie isn't all that bright, he thinks this makes her a vampire, so Tad just essentially just rolls with it. Yeah, that's right, she's a vampire. Then he just leans even harder into the joke, and Tad decides he's gonna get his girlfriend to dress up as a vampire and lay down in one of the coffins and sit up in the middle of the night and scare the shit out of Charlie. Now everything goes to plan initially, and the prank is just really going gangbusters, but unfortunately for the girlfriend, uh, the owner of the funeral parlor told Charlie some very important information about what to do when confronted with a vampire. Spoiler alert, it has to do with stakes, so it doesn't really end too well for the girlfriend. Practical jokes, they kill. (laughs) The narrator of the story is obliged by the nature of his business to make frequent journeys by ship across the Atlantic, though he's never really enjoyed this experience. On one particular voyage, he's quite happy to meet this guy named Cowley, who also hates sea journeys and is an insomniac, just like he is. So the two guys kind of while away the wee hours in the ship's game room, you know, mostly just shooting pool and smoking cigars and hanging out. They're just trying to, like, take their minds off of this constant rolling motion of the ship and the creepy deep black waves beneath them, like in the night. Well into the voyage, though, the worst possible catastrophe occurs. The ship very quickly sinks to the bottom of the ocean, leaving Cowley and the narrator trapped in the airtight game room with little hope of escape or rescue. And the rest of the story is basically like a terrifying nightmare of psychological horror as these two men try to come to terms with what's happened, going somewhat mad in the process, and eventually contemplating cannibalism in order to stay alive. Uh, This is another one of my favorite tales in the book, Uh, and this one actually has a very gruesome death by pool cue that actually really, really stuck with me over the years. So Malcolm is an artist who decides to spend a summer at this remote house with his wife, Virginia. Now, he's just quit his job at the advertising agency because he's like, I don't know if I want to be a commercial artist. And uh, But he's also just lost a fellowship that he was hoping to get. So he's kind of trying to like spend the summer sort of getting his head together and decide what he wants to do. Now, the cheap place that they rented looks well kept enough, though Malcolm, when they first get there, is a bit unnerved by... The two Dobermans, this is another story that has two Dobermans in it, uh, who peer at him through the fence of the house, like from across the street. Now, later on, he sees um, kind of a disabled guy, and he has kind of like crutches, like those metal uh, crutches, you know? And he's like in the yard of the house with the dogs, and he assumes, oh, this guy must be the caretaker. Now, the couple notices that the dogs are able to run all kinds of errands for the man, like they run down to the store and like bring him back his food and stuff like that, like in their mouths, like in a bag. So they go over to introduce themselves and they find out that this guy is named Colonel Ritchie and that he's not only very, very charming and hospitable, but he's also kind of famous. Um, He had had a movie made about him several years prior about his time in a German prison camp during World War II. Now, over the course of this conversation, he says that he learned to train the Dobermans. Uh, he learned it from the Germans, like, uh, and the two dogs, whose names are Max and Moritz, were raised and trained by him from puppies. Now, again, over the course of this long conversation that they're having, like uh, him and Malcolm of Virginia, like over tea and cookies, it becomes quite clear that Colonel Ritchie is planning to keep the couple as his prisoners uh that house across the street with the dogs as his enforcers this is yet another one of my favorites in the collection uh and this one follows a businessman named burton grunzer who's basically gunning for the job of his hated rival who's this older man named whitman hayes Now, Grunzer gets this letter from a seemingly secretive organization called Society for Collective Action, and they ask him to come to a meeting to discuss a proposition that may be of exceeding interest. 
So when he gets there, there's a guy named Carl Tucker, and he tells him all about the goals of the society, which essentially they're like, well, we believe that some people are, to put it bluntly, not fit to live, and that we can make the world a better place by essentially wishing certain people dead. Now, Grunzer, of course, is very skeptical of this, but Tucker tells him all about various voodoo curses and other things like that that worked, and he's actually, like, really persuasive. And, you know, he brings out, like, psychology and things. And Grunzer finally has to admit, you know, just knowing that a thousand people were collectively wishing you dead, that might be sufficient, like, to freak someone out enough that it would actually kill them. Now, of course, this whole time, Grunzer is thinking that this society is asking him, like, he's super special, and, you know, you have to come join our ranks or or whatever, and he's already fantasizing about wishing old Whitman Hayes, his rival, dead. But as you might have guessed, uh, Whitman Hayes is already a member of this society and has suggested Grunzer for death. So all Carl Tucker is doing is informing Grunzer of the death curse that has been placed upon him, which uh, he's basically like, sorry, began at noon today. Bye. Good luck. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I really do like this story a lot, too. So this was actually first published in 1953 under the British title, the original title, The Kraken Wakes. And this was, is this one is an entire novel that closes out the book. Now, John Wyndham, of course, uh, is probably most famous for his novels The Day of the Triffids, which, you know, was made into a movie in 1962, and The Midwich Cuckoos, which was adapted into 1960 film The Village of the Damned, uh, which, of course, was remade again in 1995. So Out of the Deeps is actually set in post-war England, and it follows married journalists, Mike and Phyllis, as they start investigating reports of a series of mysterious fireballs that fall into the ocean. Now, it's no surprise that these fireballs turn out to be alien spacecraft, and it further comes to light that these aliens, uh, being probably from a gas giant, can only live at the very high pressures at the bottom of the sea. Now, the aliens seem to be establishing their society down there, and at first, it's kind of suggested, well, maybe the humans and the aliens can, like, get along or can coexist. But, of course, the humans get real antsy about it, uh, about them being down there, and uh, one thing leads to another. Nukes get deployed, and the aliens begin mounting a several-stage attack, which ends up with most of the Earth plunged underwater, uh, which leads to widespread societal collapse. Now, eventually, uh, the Japanese come up with a weapon that wipes the aliens out, which kind of leaves humanity left to pick up the pieces of their decimated civilizations. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. This took like way longer than I thought it would because initially I wasn't going to talk about every story in the book, but then I thought, well, I like them all so much that, you know, maybe I should. And it ended up like being, <laughs> being like a much bigger undertaking than I originally intended. But oh, well, what are you going to do? Hopefully you guys had a good time with it. I had a good time writing it and recording it. As usual, uh, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. I'm really trying to grow this little channel, make it bigger. And please drop by Scarcelon. Dot com. There's a whole bunch of other written content over there, movie reviews, book reviews, things like that, which I'm sure you will find very entertaining if you like this kind of stuff. So I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye.